These motions of the atmosphere combined with the Coriolis effect lead us to a discussion of the circulation, global circulation model for the atmosphere. And really the most popular one, the one that's been taught for decades, if not centuries now, is the three cell circulation model originally put together by the American meteorologist William Farrell. This three, circula three cell circulation model talks about three regions of the atmosphere, um, a kind of that have circular motions from the tropics to mid-latitudes to the poles. They interact with each other. They're driven largely by rising air at the equator, sinking air at the poles. And it's a, a very good description of the kinds of wind patterns that we see. And the three cell circulation model leads us to an understanding of the kinds of wind patterns that we want to talk about when we talk about the surface circulation. It just turns out to be too oversimplified. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But let's talk about the three cell circulation model, the sort of old school way that the atmosphere circulates, the one you'll still find in a lot of textbooks still because it's the old way of doing it. It's like the stick model of the atom. That thing is never going away, even though we know that atoms don't really look like that. It's still a useful model for helping students understand how a particular phenomenon or process works. At the equator, we have something called the Hadley cell. Air rises at the equator and sinks at about 30 degrees north. This has enormous consequences as sinking air uh, in the formation of deserts, sort of subtropical deserts are formed as a result of sinking air from the Hadley cell. It's named after the guy that, studied, that um, discovered it, Mr. Hadley. The polar cell up at the other end, at the, at the poles, forms some air that sinks over the poles and then that air rises at around 60 degrees north and south. And between those two is what's called the feral cell. And the feral cell actually completes the circulation as we'll see these three cells interact with each other. And here's what it looks like. I'm just going to move right to the three cell model of atmospheric circulation. Because of heating from the sun, we generally have rising of air over the equator, as you can see here. Of course, as that air rises, it's going to deflect to the right or left, one way or the other, and kind of do this kind of corkscrew type of motion all the way along the equator. <clears throat> and it's the motion, that rising air of the equator, that sinking air at about 40 degrees north, 45 degrees north, this is probably 30, 60, might be 30 degrees north or so, that then returns back to the equator along the surface that gives rise to the trade winds, both the northeast trade winds, that in the northern hemisphere, and the southeast trade winds in the southern hemisphere as air rises, turns to the right, sinks, and comes back down along the surface. Of course, this is a low pressure, low pressure here because the air is rising. This is going to be higher pressure here because the air is sinking and air returning from high to low pressure and these winds as they move across the surface of course are going to the right left in the southern hemisphere and create what are known as the trade winds do you know why they're called the trade winds well if you think about it a little bit in the early days of trade between continents we didn't have airplanes we didn't have automobiles we didn't have powered ships we just had sailing ships and those sailing ships moving from Europe to Americas or from the Americas less so to Asia but mostly from Europe to America took the winds that allowed them to move the fastest and so they called those the trade winds all right so these are the winds that sailing ships took along the trop at tropical latitudes a lot close closer to the equator not exactly on the equator because this is an area of no winds we just have a rising air uh, area known as the doldrums, but they sailed along these winds go from east to west. That's the Hadley cell. The polar cell really has sinking air because of course the cooling effects of um, in those higher latitudes because that air doesn't get heated again. So we have cooler air that's sinking and moving again to the right in the northern hemisphere, moving to the, can't, it's not shown here, but um, moving to the right in the northern hemisphere, we'd have the same kind of thing on the South Pole, again, not shown here, and creating what are called the polar easterlies, all right? Sinking air 
moving along the surface, rising at about 60 degrees north. And in between that, we have the feral cell. So mostly this is driven by warm air rising over the equator, driving the Hadley cell, which has an influence on the feral cell. If you think of this as like a series of gears that then has an influence on the polar cell, although sinking of air cooling and sinking of air here is another driving force. So the real engines are the equatorial heat engine and the polar cooling engine, but really it's the equator that's the major, the, the tropics and heating along the equator that's a major driver of this three cell circulation model. Okay, so this is the standard model of circulation. I forgot to mention the westerlies, of course, but again, air sinking, air sinking, air moving northwards because this is an area of lower pressure, air rising here, and winds moving to the right. So these winds tend towards the west, so those are called the westerlies. And these are sort of the return route of trade from North America to Europe. So we have the trade winds, we have the westerlies, and these are really the important winds that we want to talk about when we get to ocean circulation. Okay, I'm going to go back a slide. And if you just check out this slide um, on your own on the gallery of slides, uh, the important things are, again, as I said before, the trade winds and the westerlies, but also the doldrums and this place called the horse latitudes. I want to come back to that a little bit. The horse latitudes, both the doldrums, which are here, and the horse latitudes, which are up here, are formed in areas where you have rising air. And when you have air rising, it's not moving along the surface of the ocean, and that's no good for boats that are trying to use wind to get from point A to point B. So the doldrums are a place where there's no winds, it's hot and listless, uh, it created lots of problems on sailing ships. If a, sa if a captain took his ship into the doldrums, um, he was not thought very well of. In fact, that's probably what led to uh, the ditching of Captain Bly and that whole story. And the horse latitudes are another interesting, have another interesting story to them, and probably a lot of it is folklore, but if ships got caught in these horse latitudes where there's very little wind or no wind, and particularly if they were bringing horses from North America to Europe, or I don't know if they did that vice versa. I think usually the horse trade was going this direction. Or in the Pacific Ocean as well. If they were stuck here for a long time, they were running out of water. And it was a choice of preserving water for the horses or preserving water for the men, because they weren't making water in those days. It's just what the ship carried with it. And so lots of horses died as a result unfortunately. And so in the horse latitudes, it kind of got to be named that. Again, this is according to the folklore. The horses get thrown, the dead horses will get thrown overboard. And I know that's very upsetting to a lot of people. So think about this. When those horses, dead horses, were thrown overboard into the ocean, they turned into seahorses. And so that's where seahorses come from. Okay, so if you're upset about dead horses being thrown into the ocean, just imagine that they turned into seahorses and everything will be all right. Okay, origins of the horse latitudes.